Uh, Astronomy Cast, episode 254 for Monday, February 27th, 2012. Reflection and Refraction. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Um, so once again, we're recording this episode of Astronomy Cast as a live Google Plus Hangout. And if you ever want to join us and watch us record this show live, you can just go to uh, cosmoquest.org slash hangouts, and we've got a listing of all of the really cool uh, live hangouts that we've been doing. But you know, not just Astronomy Cast, we're doing our weekly space hangout, we're live streaming telescopes, we're interviewing astronomers and uh, astron- so you know, space more. scientists and, you know, you name it, we've, we've been covering it, so, so check that out if you want to participate in any of this stuff. And you can interact with us, you can ask us questions, you can jump into our Hangouts, we're having a lot of fun. And i got one more thing. Okay, <laughs> which is it. Which is, if, you, if you've never done this, one of the best ways to help out Astronomy Cast is to go and write a review on us in iTunes. Yeah. And so you can go to iTunes, search for Astronomy Cast, and then you can leave a review and let people know what you think about the show and the stuff that we're doing. So that's cool. That was all my stuff for this week. That you works. Uh, you're wearing a kind of awesome shirt. Oh, well, that's right. On. Yeah, I'm, I'm a walking, <laughs> talking billboard for Astronomy Cast. But the problem is the people who are listening to this won't be able to see it. But I am wearing my Venus Transit Authority shirt, which I guess anyone watching can see it. <laughs> no, they can't. Yeah. Your mic is exactly eclipsing yeah. the shirt. There, is shirt. that working? <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, we're really excited about, uh, about this year's uh, tr- uh, Transit of Venus, which is going to be happening in June. Of course, we will be live casting that to pieces, but uh, um, this is going to be the last year for anyone living to watch it. Let's and and we've created a shirt that will contain all of the pieces of paper you're right. most likely to lose on the shirt. It's so on the front of the shirt, there's a map of the path of Venus across the sun, and on the back of the shirt is a map of where on the planet you need to be to see the transit. Right. right. And so that way, you know, all else fails, just wear that shirt, and then you'll know, and you'll You're have good. all the details that you need. Anyone who's there who needs to know where to look and what to see, they'll, they'll be able to do it. So that's, that's awesome. I love, I love this idea of, of, like, shirt as instruction manual. <laughs> yes, it's, I think it's that's really cool. So I lose paper. I'm not yeah. going to wear the shirt I'm wearing. Yeah. yeah, you should have one that just has like your your uh, physics formula, you know. And then just while you're doing your work, <laughs> you need to like you know like how do I calculate the spectroscopy of that? Oh right, and you just lift up your shirt and take a look at the right corner, and you've got the yeah. information there. Maxwell's <gasps> equations. It's a great shirt. <laughs> All right, well, let's get on with today's show then. So light can do some pretty strange stuff, like pass through objects and bounce off them. It can be broken up and recombined. In fact, everything we see is just the end result of reflection and refraction of light. So it's time to understand how it all works. So this is the part, this is one of the situations that I, like, I bent the minds of my children when I was explaining them, you know, to them the concept that when they see something that is like green, they're seeing the reflected photons that came from the sun. And they're like, what? <laughs> right? Furthermore, um, we're seeing the refracted photons that have come from the sun passing through our atmosphere. And again, it's, it's super confusing. So, so what are, so what is this? Let's start with like the journey of a photon. We okay. have a, a photon that leaves the sun, travels to Earth, passes through the atmosphere, maybe goes through a window or two, bounces off something, maybe bounces off something again and goes into someone's eyeball. What's happening? Well, the the first thing you realize is while you may be following the journey of one ray of light, it may not be the same photon that gets to your eye that left the sun originally. Um, or in fact was originally created. Cause there's also a whole lot of absorption and re-emission processes that are going on. Well, we'll so include those two, but yeah. So, so you start off with something creates a photon, and, and my dog just managed to open a door and trap itself in this room. So I'm sorry, we're having one of those reality impinged moments. <laughs> That's right, this will be edited out of the final show. Sorry, Preston, for the dog interruption. Okay. Sorry, the, the method I had for keeping the dog out only succeeded in keeping the dog in. Um, 
Okay, so, so the original photon that was created may not be the same photon that reaches your eye. So you have some sort of an event deep in the core of the sun, gives off energy. And this bit of energy, as it travels through the sun, is going to get absorbed by an atom, re-emitted in a new direction, absorbed by another atom, re-emitted in another direction. And this entire process is one of, of what's called Brownian motion. Um, it's, it's the path, that, the way they always explain it in physics books, which I think says something about the physics community, is you know how drunk people walk, that trying to get somewhere, but they're sort of going in all directions? That, that's the motion of, of light as it tries to travel to exit the sun. Well, once the light finally breaks free of the surface of the, the sun, then it, it's mostly a clean path straight to Earth. So assuming it doesn't end up uh, hitting dust, doesn't end up hitting, well, Mercury or Venus or anything else that lies between us and the sun. Spacecraft. Spacecraft. Uh, right. Yeah, SOHO does inter intercept a fair amount of light. SDO intercepts a fair amount of light. Yeah. Um, but assuming that it, it, it hits a straight path towards Earth, then you'll have a photon, and this may be the billionth photon that has been part of this journey of a, of a piece of energy, um, it's going to hit the surface of our atmosphere. Now, light travels at different rates through different materials. And this has a lot of complicated physics behind it, which basically boils down to the, the way the light um, interacts with the materials changes both for sound and for uh, light and for pretty much any wave, it changes its velocity based on the composition of the material. Right, and that's why we always say the speed of light in a vacuum. In a right? vacuum. We always add that asterisk, right? In a vacuum, speed of light through glass is different than the speed of light in a vacuum. And that's why they, you know, physicists have said they can slow light down to the walking speed. Yeah, and, and it, it's not that hard to get lights s slowed down to the speed of a Cessna aircraft just using hot rubidium gas. Um, so different materials cause light to travel at different speeds, and different wavelengths of light respond in different ways. So this suddenly gets very complicated. Um, but looking in general, when light hits a material that is in a vacuum, it's going to slow down. And this is where something that, that I consider a bit of the universe conducting black magic occurs. There's this property referred to as Snell's Law that basically says if you have light at point A and you're trying to observe light at point B, the path the light is going to take between those two points is the path that causes it to have the shortest journey time. Now, the thing that makes this kind of black magic is if you can imagine that the light is passing through a series of different materials, pocket of hot gas, pocket of cold gas, vacuum from the sun, or vacuum from outer space, and we're looking at sunlight. Well, as the light travels through each of the materials, its speed is going to vary. And just as you can imagine driving through a city, and you have to make these choices. Do I get on the highway? Do I get on the main street? Do I take the back roads with lots of stop signs? And you optimize your path, not for the distance you travel, but how are you going to get there fastest? Well, light does that same optimization, not what is the shortest trip I can take, but what is the fastest trip I can take? And so when you look at the passage of the light between those two points, the light is actually going to bend and spend a longer distance in the higher speed material and a shorter distance in the, short, in the um, slower speed material to optimize its speed. Oh. And it, it's one of those, wait, how did the light know ahead of time that this was the correct option to take? And, and it's a matter of lights going in all directions. Right, so hold on. So you just like blew my mind there. So <laughs> let me just take a second to, to unpack that. So if I understand yeah. this correctly, right, that when we see light moving through water and we see, you know, or like we see like a, you know, you take like a stick and you put it into water and, and mm -hmm. you can see the stick up on top of the water and it's sort of at one angle and then as you're seeing the stick through the water, it's shifted to this other angle. Yeah. And so in other words, we know that the light that is showing us the stick has bent in the light. And so what you're saying is, is that light has chosen this angle because this gives it the shortest travel time? Yes, exactly. And it could be a further travel distance 
but at the end of the day, it's most concerned about the shortest travel time, and that's exactly. why we see it bend. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Now, I, the choice, the, the thing is, it's not like light is actually making a choice. It not just close. happens to work out this way. And so when you start looking at things mathematically, and, and this is where I'm wishing I had better props in my office. Well, remember that people are listening to the show. So that, that's not, true. They will never see your props. Yes. Okay. Um, so if, if you have a surface and light is going to hit that surface, then the surface has, you can imagine there's always some line that's coming out from that surface in a right angle. Now, when the light hits that surface, there's going to be some angle between it and whatever that perpendicular, that right angle line is. And the way it works is when the light hits the surface, its angle relative to that perpendicular, rel relative to that, we call it normal to the surface, it's going to bend inwards. So this is where when you look at a pencil, the pencil always appears to bend in the exact same direction. Now, what's really cool is you can actually change how the pencil appears to bend by adding things to the water, by um, comparing side by side a pencil or a straw in a glass of alcohol and a glass of sugar water and a glass of regular water. It's very small differences, but it's still just neat that we can actually play with the path of light. And so if you could actually see the light refracting through that, that uh, rubidium gas, you would get a different angle. You would get a completely different angle. Right. And what, what's also interesting about this is it also varies with, with the color of the light that's doing this. So say you had a red laser and you had a green laser. One interesting trick to do is to shine them into a cutting board, um, just one of those plasticky acrylic um, they're usually a whitish color, uh, boring, cheap cutting boards that you can get at the local dime store. I have one well, like right in front of me. You can't see it because my kitchen is dirty, <laughs> but I have one. I'm looking at one right now, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. So you get one of those cheapy cutting boards that, that allows light to pass through it. We'll shine a red laser into it and shine a green laser into it and make sure very carefully that the lasers are absolutely parallel to each other. You can do this by putting a piece of graph paper down. Then look at how their light bends as it enters the cutting board. And if you're very precise, you can see slight differences in how the light of these two radically different colors gets bent as it enters the cutting board. Wow. So the light will get bent from from a laser passing through the cutting board? Yeah, because, because okay, you're gotta, going... Hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> so for those of you who are out there listening, Fraser is in his kitchen, and he's going to go find a laser and find a cutting board at this moment. Th this is actually one of those experiments that we used to have our students do as... <laughs> that we used to have our students do as group projects when I taught astronomy. Um, <laughs> so, I, I'm looking to see what the, what the audience is saying. Um, All right. So here we go. Got a cutting board. Got a green laser. Okay, you oh, need to go in the edge of the laser. You need to go in the edge of the cutting board. What's that? You need to go into the edge of the cutting board. Yeah, like this way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see. So you need to get Whoa, the light. Oh, I don't know if we can see behind me. So you should be able to see it through the surface of the cutting board. Yeah. Except we can't see the surface of your cutting board. I can board. see it. I can see it coming out the top of the cutting board, like a line. I don't know if we can see it. There we go. <laughs> well, well, I'll I'll try and do this experiment. I'll go get a cheapy cutting board and post pictures of it later. Not that I can actually do this though. <laughs> I love lasers. So, so to do this experiment well, you, you need one of the really cheap cutting boards that's also like a quarter of an inch thick, and you literally shine the laser into the edge of the cutting board, and you can watch its path across the top of the board. Yeah, I could actually see the line of the, of the laser across the top of the board, so that's really cool. All right. But, but I just don't have a red laser. But this is, this is actually one of those things that allows you to understand how prisms work, because if you think about... Um, prisms that create beautiful rainbows, a lot of people buy them as wind chimes and hang them in their windows and stuff. 
this is a case of light entering a material, in this case glass or crystal, and when that light ray of white light of all the different colors combined, usually a beam of sunlight, enters the prism, all the different colors get bent at slightly different angles. And it's that difference in all of the angles that things are getting bent that ends up leading to beautiful rainbows, ends up leading to um, being able to do spectroscopy. And in this case, it's a matter of the shorter wavelengths are the ones that are getting bent the most, the longer wavelengths are getting bent the least, and um, the, the entire amount that things get bent determines how big a rainbow you're able to produce. Right, and so you've got this situation where you've got the, the sunlight coming from the sun that contains photons of every color. They're all hitting that medium, in this case, the glass of the, of the prism, yeah. and they're getting ref refracted at different angles because of their wavelength and then they're coming out the other side and going in their various directions. So, Now this is also the problem with refracting telescopes. So if you have a nice little cheap, doesn't have fancy what are called aprochromatic lenses, if you have a nice normal cheap refracting telescope, it will have a lens for the eyepiece, a lens for the objective, that's the end that the light comes in through. Um, and as, as light passes through each of these different lenses, different colors get bent, bent different amounts, so you end up seeing um, different colors and focus in slightly different places, which, which call, causes what's called chromatic distortion. Now, we get around that by using um, compound lenses that use multiple materials and try and compensate for all of that. It makes the telescopes extraordinarily expensive. Um, but it's usually worth it to spend all that money for an astronomical view. And it's sort of about trying to bring the light back together, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So, okay, so we got a little off, off track here. So we've talked about the light coming through the atmosphere or glass or something like that, and it's getting refracted, and we've talked about the physics yeah. of that. Now, what about the reflection part? So the reflection part is actually way more complicated than anyone would ever imagine. It's one of those things that when I first saw it completely explained out in quantum mechanics, I sort of cursed the universe for the complexity. So when we normally think of, of reflection, you think of like a photon of light comes Bouncing. down, bounces off of the surface, continues on like a pink. No. No, that has no? nothing to do with it. Nothing? No, you actually, okay. a photon comes down interacts with a top level of atoms in the material, has all sorts of complicated things that involve skin effect and the electromagnetic fields and reversing of polarity, and a new photon comes out in the opposite direction with a completely different phase of the first photon. Um, and, and so it's actually a highly complicated process. Can you, like, I mean, we don't want to, like, completely gloss over it, but so are you saying that reflection is but but it's not absorption right it's not like the photon is being absorbed and a completely different photon is being emitted yeah it is is so all reflection is absorption is that what you're saying so it's 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 a interaction with the surface of the material process so the the incoming photon comes in interacts new photon comes out Completely different photon. Completely different photon. Different right. phase. A brand new arts. baby photon. Yeah. And, and, but can the, because I mean, from what I, you know, what we always talk about, you know, we say like you see a tree and the tree is green and so you're seeing yeah. like all of the light from the sun is hitting, you know, the, all of the colors of the sun are hitting that tree and then we're seeing the green, a prevalence of green photons being emitted in our direction, right? What, so, what, so what we're seeing is, is the um, material that the leaves are made of is prefer preferentially re-emitting green photons based on all of the stuff that's hitting during that skin effect at the surface of the leaf. And so if it's getting hit by more colors than just green, is it warming up? Is it absorbing that? Is it turning it's, the it's excess absorbing, into heat? It's warming up. It's undergoing chemical processes. This is where you get into the whole ADP cycle that some of right, us were forced to memorize. Chlorophyll, it's making energy. Yeah. Right, right. But just like a regular object. So, but what about something like a mirror that is, that is going to be reflecting the light, you know, almost, you know, some object with a really high albedo? 
Right. So, so reflective surfaces, this, this simply means that most of the photons, when they hit that top skin effect layer of the material, are ending up interacting and going back off in, in the other direction in very precisely mathematically described ways. Now, what's interesting is where you have um, diffuse, diffuse reflection. This is where uh, when you look at the light coming off of a surface, it gets completely scrambled. And so you have a surface that's reflecting light, but it's not reflecting an image. It's because some of the light's able to actually pass deeper into the surface before it, it undergoes this reflection process and comes back out. So the diffuse reflection is where you're, you're hitting all sorts of different angles inside the material and you're hitting different depths inside the material. And so the light is coming out with a whole variety of different angles um, from, from what it originally had going in. So can you have situations where there's like reflection and refraction happening at the same time? I mean, is that what that's that called binoculars? <laughs> binoculars. <laughs> well, right. so so think about it. grab a pair of binoculars, and on a, a daylight, grab a friend, and go outside and look at a bird, and have your friend look at the front surface of your binocular lens, and they're going to actually be able to see the daylight scene reflecting back at them, because every surface. Um, every glass surface actually both reflects some of the light and allows some of the light to, to transfer through the material, and the light that's getting transferred through the material is what's getting refracted. So I guess, as always, we try to bring this back around to astronomy. And right. so what are some of the ways that astronomers will use this? I mean, obviously, we talked a bit about the lenses that we use in the telescope. So what impact does that have on like, the actual gear that astronomers use? Right, so, so with things like binoculars and telescopes, the, the whole problem of some of the light getting reflected and some of it getting refracted through the surface means that we want to try and figure out how can we use chemistry to alter the surface of, of our lenses to make sure that the most light possible gets transmitted through the material. And this is where an expensive pair of binoculars will have this purplish multi-coat on the surface of the objective lens, and that strange colored overcoating is, is actually a material that increases the amount of light that gets transmitted through the objective lens of your binoculars. We also worry about um, sometimes increasing how much light gets reflected, and this is where mirrors for, for reflecting telescopes also have very special overcoatings on them. So a extremely expensive um, mirror is going to have usually either a silvering on it or it's going to be luminized, but the combination of atoms that the mirror gets coated with is, is usually some extremely uh, patented, highly worked out, experimentally determined recipe that increases, optimizes the amount of light that gets reflected at the wavelengths that we're most interested in studying. So the whole point of, of building modern telescopes isn't just to make sure that the light gets as precisely focused as possible, but it's also to utilize chemistry to make sure that every surface that the light has to pass through, it passes through as optimally as possible, and every light that every surface the light has to reflect off of, it gets reflected off as optimally as possible. And altogether, uh, we, we end up talking about what the quantum efficiency of a telescope, and that boils down to all of the surfaces combined, and then how well the detector, which is really where quantum efficiency comes in, how well does the detector do at finally detecting the photons that make it to it? And I think we've, we've talked quite a lot about the visible light, but obviously, you know, the entire electromagnetic magnetic right. spectrum runs from radio through to gamma radiation. So, so how does that play into this process as well? I mean, are gamma rays refracting through water or? I, know, gamma rays kind of do what things? they want to do. So <laughs> these, these really high energy wavelengths of light, um, the, the surface that, that you need to use to end up um, stopping and reflecting a, a photon, um, that, that surface that you need depends on what the wavelength of light is. So you basically need the spacing between um, the bits to be such that I think it's, it's, sorry, I just had a complete brain fart and I can't remember if it's two or one half. Um, 
I'm, I'm not going to put an exact number in. Sorry, Preston, this is going to be one of those episodes. Um, so the, the spacing that you need between two bits of material that are trying to reflect the light is directly related to the light. This is where you can build radio telescopes out of essentially chicken wire because radio wavelengths, they can be several centimeters to several meters across. And, and so radio happily reflects off of, of chicken wire. Now, at, at the same time, gamma rays are extremely small and just want to pass directly through whatever you put in front of them um, until it gets extraordinarily dense. And this is where you start using lead bricks to stop them. And you can't really use lead bricks easily to reflect them. But when they start building gamma ray observatories and x-ray observatories, they are using special foils to try and um, very carefully scatter the light into a narrower and narrow area to detect it. Right, right. But the point being that, you know, infrared is going to have that same effect. Ultraviolet yeah. is going to have that same effect, but yeah. it's just going to be changed depending on the medium and depending on its, on its wavelength. Exactly. All light has this same, reacts with the skinning of the material, reacts with, um, and, and different materials are opaque and transparent. Glass, for instance, will completely block ultraviolet for you. So any of you out there in the audience who have an iguana, if you're trying to shine your iguana's special solar lamp through the glass of your aquarium, it won't work. Um, and that's why you can't get a sunburn when you're in the car window, right? Behind right. The window. But if you roll that window down, your, your driving arm will be toasty by the end of the day. Right, exactly. Now, we've talked about how the, the astronomers will actually incorporate reflection and refraction into their gear. But how do they bring it into their actual techniques when they're looking at objects? I mean, are there things that they need to look through or see reflected from? Well, we have to take into consideration the fact that where the stars appear in the sky is not where they are actually located. Um, and and as as an object moves across the sky because the planet's rotating, it's not the object moving. Um, the amount of atmosphere that the light has to pass through is constantly changing, which means that the distance the light spends within the atmosphere and the amount of bending that it is experiencing is constantly changing. And this all adds up to we can actually see slightly over the horizon because of the way light is bent. And we have to, when we're pointing telescopes, compensate for how the atmosphere bends the light. So we, we have to take all of that into consideration. Um, when it comes to celestial, celestial observations, we're actually somewhat more worried about how gravity bends things at time because we can also get the same sort of refracting bending of the light, not just from light passing through media, but also from light passing gravitationally near a star, a galaxy, something else. Wow. But we've done entire shows on this. It's called yeah. gravitational lensing. Right. And there's a lot of situations I know where where the reflection of the light, like right. there's things like earth light shine, echoes. light echoes, things like that where you can actually see um, and learn a bit. You can see X X rays bouncing off um, what, Jupiter and things like that. And, and one of the more interesting things that's going on right now is light from Eta Carina from when it had its uh, 1800s outburst. That light is just now, um, it's hit a background surface, a, a surface of gas and dust, has reflected off that surface, and the reflection is just now hitting Earth. So we're able to reobserve the reflected light of that nova to, to actually get whole new observations out of it. Right, so if you miss it the first time around, you can just wait for the reflection, wait for the exactly. echo. That's really cool. All right, well, that's great, Pamela. Thank you very much again, and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, Fraser. Talk to you later. All right, save. And you now have seen all the horrible realities that go into filming Astronomy Cast, where I forget things and have dogs invade, and Fraser decides to experiment in real time. So welcome to the backstage of our show. <laughs> I guess the first time I've actually dug out the laser to, to confirm something you just said. <laughs> Always skeptical of your wild claims. Um, it's actually a really fun student project to do because the first time they hold the laser up to the side of the cutting board, they're like, it's not going to bend. And oh, my gosh, it bent. And it's, really so it's, cool. it's really cool. All right, and I'm going to save another file, too. Give that 
six seconds and then we'll be done. All right. <clears throat> cool. We got 70 comments. Excellent. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so this is the point where we very slowly try and read and talk simultaneously. And, no, right. what I'm going to do, I will post a link to the Hangout itself. Um, and so if anyone wants to jump in and ask a question directly, then we'll make that link available and you can come in and join us. Um, and ideally, uh, you have a, you have headphones on yes. so that we don't get an echo. So don't try to play the audio out of your computer unless you've done a lot of hangouts and you know that it works and you're going to want to have a camera uh, attached. To your, uh, to your hangout, so that would be great. Um, so if you've never done a hangout before, I don't recommend jumping in because there's lots of little things that can go wrong. But I've just posted a link to the hangout. Um, it ends in EN pound. And so if you want to jump in and ask us a question, that would be great. And until then, I will ask uh, a bunch of questions. Brian says, oh my god, we fake the goodbye. Yes, we fake the goodbye in that um, <laughs> we don't actually hang up the call. We, uh, we say goodbye and then we continue. What we used to, well no, yeah. what you used to do is we would, we would say goodbye and then we would go, okay, I'm saving. Are you saving? Yeah, did it work? Did yeah. you remember? Yes. Okay, great. Bye. <laughs> but now well, we, and, uh, and the first couple of hangouts we did we actually just sort of goodbyed at the end, and, and it was kind of weird. It's like, oh, we're not still talking anymore. I lost my Fraser. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of the side effects of not doing this in Skype anymore. Yeah. Um, all right. <clears throat> so any more questions? Okay, Fraser Valley Astronomers wrote, okay, I need a ball preen hammer now to unconfuse my gray matter. You know, hammers won't unconfuse your gray matter. Books. So, so someone asked, what would I recommend? I, I hate to say, all of my physics books are in my on-campus office, which is next to our conference room, which is why I tend to record at home so that you don't end up having to accidentally hear university politics and the occasional shouting that occurs very rarely, usually directed at, at computers that have poor microphones rather than actual yelling. Um, but. Uh, there, there's, I have a blue optics book in my office. I'll look up the name and put it up in the show notes when the show goes up. So again, if anyone has a question in the comments, we're glad to, glad to answer them about anything. You've seen Pamela can handle the questions. Um, <laughs> as long as you don't ask me for specific so numbers. So Karen Carey asked, if I were to run a red and green laser simul simultaneously through material, would they bend differently? Yes. Yes, they would. Okay. That's it. <laughs> right. So the point being that you would see the I green you, bends more. Now, what if you went through like glass? Would yeah, it, would same it happen thing. as well? Same thing. Yeah. So if I just, you know, if I somehow lined them up so they're perfectly parallel, ran them through the glass, you would see them bend in sort of two different so ways. So I, I have probably confused more Home Depot workers with homework assignments that I've given than anyone else. So one, one of the things that I used to do is send students to Home Depot to find materials that, ref, that refracted light at different different amounts, and so they'd go through all of the window and bathroom and cutting board section with their lasers and looking to see what bent the light various amounts, and then they'd, ball, they'd buy small amounts to use for their fi final projects. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, go to Home Depot with a laser and just start shining it through the sides of things, and, and that's the catch is, so if, if this is a cutting board, you want the laser I have entirely the wrong color background. Let me find something. That's okay. Better. I think we can see it. Okay. So, so basically, let's try this and this. So uh, you want to shine it through the side of the material, and you want to do it at an angle. If you go like this, it's going to go straight through. So shine the laser in at an angle, and what you'll see is as the material goes through, it will actually change angles. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Let me try that again. Let's see. So shine it at an angle. So there's the there's the light. I don't know if you can see the light coming up through. Oh, hold on. I think your cutting board may be a little too thin to do this easily. Yeah. It works best with those really stupidly thick cutting boards. Right. I don't know if you can see the line coming through. Okay, I see it now. There. So bend your your laser, and you'll see 
relative to the body of the laser, the angle of the laser will be different. Oh, it's so hard. It's really easy to do this on a desk. So you put the cutting board down on the surface and, and yeah. tape. Yeah. yeah, so you can see the, the angle coming off the laser yep. is yep, different. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's bending to the left. Yep, and that's exactly what it should do. Science. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, we've got a whole bunch of people now. We've got a full crowd. This is awesome. <laughs> so we've got uh, we've got Bart and Brian and Ciro and Paul and Graham and Ryan and Tanner and Thomas. So uh, put your hand up if you've got a question, and I will get to you. A science question. A science question. All right. All right. Bart. So, Bart, go ahead. Well, it's not so much uh, working him. Go ahead. Can can yeah, okay, you can hear me. Well, it's not so much of a question. Um, Fraser, I've heard you ask uh, how Kuiper is pronounced in uh, Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> and since I'm Dutch, I thought maybe I can answer that question. I love it's it. It's Kuiper. 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 As it rhymes with a viper snake. Right. We can't, we, you know, in English we have a really hard time with the normal part. So, um, oh, Graham, I'm going to, you got a big background noise. I'm going to mute you. Sorry. Uh, nothing personal. Um, right. So, Kuiper. Is that okay? That's the best I can do with my uh, English <laughs> I like the way Bart's going, no. No, no. <laughs> no that's not but it's okay. not. Ask Kuiper. He's in the ISS right now. But it's not, but it's not Kuiper. Right, I mean that's the a lot of people have been saying it's Kuiper and and but it's Kuiper. So that's the best. The best. Kuiper is closer, but it's Kuiper. Kuiper. I can't even hear the difference between those two things. I'm so dead. Kuiper. <laughs> that's the best I can do. I'm sorry. <gasps> awesome. All right. So Ryan, you had a question. Um. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, it was kind of a fascinating subject on reflection, and I I was just thinking about some things because. You know, I've heard some stories in the past where, um, you know, radio signals were picked up that have bounced off of objects, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, we heard like television or radio broadcasts from, you know, a long time ago. And, you know, I had the thought, the random thought of, you know, just, you know, actual visible light. So, in other words, if, if let's say, you know, there was some object that was maybe 110, 115 light years away, like a big mirror, for instance, and, you know, the reflection of Earth was on there, and so when it came back, we would kind of be able to see uh, maybe the time when the Constitution was signing. Is that something that's theoretically possible? The, the pro it's a matter of just not enough light. Um, so when, when we hear reflected radio signals, it's, it's from, at most, somebody typing loudly. Yeah, I just mean it's zero. Okay. We heard all um, your typing there. So uh, when, when we hear reflected radio, it, it's usually from like a few minutes ago. Um, and, and in fact, if you turn your radio on to some place between two stations during a meteor shower, you'll hear whistling occasionally. And that whistling is actually reflections of um, radio stations getting Doppler shifted coming off of uh, the ionized material in the atmosphere. Um, so, so we're only able to see a little bit back in time as, as in we can look at our watch and go, oh yeah, I was eating dinner when that happened and that was like I'm still chewing and digesting. Um, so if we tried to, to um, look back in time by looking at reflections far in the past, the Earth just doesn't give off enough photons. Um, we can nominally see our sun reflected in the past but but earth there's it's just not enough light so but but couldn't you if you could theoretically put a great big sphere around the earth out to a distance of 300 light years and gather every photon that came from earth you would if you could somehow put it back together you would you would essentially be able to look back in time right you you'd be able to look back in time but how would you decouple the the earth's photons from the sun's photons and everything Not my else? problem. That is not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no it's ju it's just a matter of losing the light in in the glare of the sun. We're we're tiny. Yeah, no no, but I mean the point with the, with our concept of the light echoes, right? You're seeing yeah. light bouncing from some you know nebula and you're seeing objects that might have happened before you even 
new to observe it, right? right. I mean, you're you're being able to kind of look back in time. I always have this conversation with my kids. You know, we say, you know, if someone lived on Alpha Centauri and they were looking at us right now, they would see the Earth four years ago. And and, and so with light echoes, what's happening right now. We do use light echoes to look at events that happened in the past, but light light echoes are currently someone grab your loud again. Um, light echoes are are related to events that are um, extraordinarily bright. So supernovae, false novae, uh, all those sorts of extremely bright events, those give off enough light, but normal day-to-day -day stuff just doesn't. It's Is that the bad. same for like, um, well, like Kepler, the new Kepler planet, extrasolar planet that was discovered? From what we're seeing from that, how how long ago would that have been, the light that we're receiving from that planet? Um, well, it's, so all of the Kepler objects are fairly close. I don't know their exact distances, but I want to say they're all like tens of light years away. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've got a question in the chat that came from Brian. I guess he's got to be quiet at work so no one can know. <laughs> Shh. We'll keep your secret. <laughs> um, so, and it, but his question is pretty complicated, so let's, let's take a crack at it here. So uh, can you elaborate a bit on photon refraction and reflection occurring because of the quanta, photon's quantum superposition, specifically relating to waveform collapse? So he, you know when you wanted to gloss over the uh, quantum <laughs> mechanics, he wants you to ungloss and actually dig into it a little bit. Okay, so I, I have to admit I don't have enough of that crammed into my head right now to go into it in detail other than to say it's, it's a combination of all of the electric fields working together um, to essentially create a new photon that has, a, for conservation purposes, it has a phase angle that is pi off of the original incoming photon. Um, I will look into doing... Um, something more in detail on this. It, it's one of those things that I don't need to know day to day, so I let that part of quantum mechanics not stay in my brain. Because <laughs> that's all that would be in your brain, right? Yes. Well, what it, was, it, was someone used to say that, right? That anyone who says they understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics? Well, I think you're allowed to know aspects of quantum mechanics uh, in great detail. You just can't know all of it simultaneously. Um... So on the on the the comments section, uh, Scott Lewis made a suggestion that people read uh, Lawrence Krauss's uh, "The Universe from Nothing," and I I highly uh, agree with. That. I, have, I haven't read his book yet, but he's he's done. There's sort of a video floating around on the web, uh, which is like an hour long presentation that he did, which is one of the best pieces of sort of explaining some of those deep questions of like why is there something and not nothing kinds of questions. It's a fantastic video if you ever want to get a chance to watch it. And, and if any of you want to actually have a, and you have calculus, four years of calculus required for this, or four semesters, rather. Um, if you have four semesters of calculus and you want to actually read about all of the quantum mechanics stuff that I'm currently glossing over, uh, the book Quant Introduction to Quantum Mechanics by Gasorowitz, um, G-A-S-R, long, last name, um, it is actually a, it's the most readable of the quantum mechanics books that I've looked at so far. Yeah, and um, sorry, sir, what, uh, what Paul mentioned, Paul just mentioned in chat, for anyone who joins us, the, the, when you first join, just make sure you mute your microphone uh, if you can, because in many cases you can't know if you've got background sound, and then it sort of switches to you and it makes this hissing sound and everybody notices. So just, you know, if you're going to jump into Hangouts in the future, try to mute your microphone as quickly as you can and stay on mute, and then if you've got a question or something you want to say, then by all means unmute yourself. Um, and that's just sort of part of the habits that we've all picked up as we've been doing these, these Hangouts. Um, so did anyone else have a question? Put your hand up. Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, okay, we got, uh, got Thomas. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah. Hello. Um, I've seen uh, pictures of uh, radio telescope, uh, especially of uh, distant objects, and uh, I wonder, is that picture built up by pixel by pixel when they do ra radio astronomy, or do they have a kind of a wide field radio telescope that can register the picture at a wider angle at once? 
So with, with radio telescopes, it's actually probably the most miserable way to try and image the sky. Um, so Nicole's out there listening, and she's probably going, no, radio telescopes are awesome. No, I agree, radio telescopes are awesome. But to build up these beautifully detailed pictures that you sometimes see, uh, the, the way they do it is, is they actually s either scan across the sky, measuring the intensity of the light pixel by pixel, or they'll do a pattern where they measure it this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, and they'll, so they'll have a grid, and then they move the grid, and then they move the grid. And, and so it's, it's only by adding up a pixel at a time over time that they're able to get these beautiful images that you eventually end up seeing. Um, it's, it's a slow process, but it's, it's just a matter of uh, you can't really build CCDs for radio telescopes. It's kind of an all or nothing pointed in the sky kind of process. Okay, thank you. And so you get these situations like you've got like the telescope in Arecibo. It can only see a, just a small portion of the sky. But the nice thing about, about Arecibo right? is the whole sky passes over it. So it can essentially do giant strip, giant strip. And, and, and because of, of the Earth's tilt, it's able to get different strips throughout the year. And there, there is some ability with Arecibo to steer. So you have a, a big dish with a um, focus at the top. And they can move the, the thing that they focus the light onto a little bit. And so they're able to get slightly different cones of, of the sky based on where they move that secondary around to. But we did we did a whole show on, on radio astronomy and yeah, and that was the gist of it was that that it's not like you're focusing the light, it's more like you're just registering the strength of the signal at every spot in the sky and then building up this this complicated image. And, and Nicole's making the point, you can make CCDs for radio telescopes. Focal plane arrays are under development. Yes, they're under development. And some in use have a few pixels. That, that's what I was talking about. How's that coming, Nicole? Stamps. Are those done yet? Are yeah, finished? no, no. So, but this working? is what I meant, Nicole, with the, the you can take stamps on the sky, and you still do have to move it around to build up big pixels, big pictures with many pixels. Um, Oh, there was another question. Um, okay, so Scott Lewis asked, uh, since photons are inherently invisible, we only see the remnants of them after they interact with nor normal matter, would dark energy work similarly to light without it actually interacting with normal matter? Sorry, can you say, I was trying to read comments and listen, and I failed. Sure, sure, sure. So, so um, and I don't know if you meant dark energy, you meant dark matter. Um, so since photons are invisible, we only see them after they interact. In other words, they after they reflect. Yeah. Wouldn't dark energy work s similarly to light with actually interfering with normal matter? Um, so, so what, what's being pointed out here is when you look around a room, you don't see this constant fuzz of photons, even right. though as you look around the room, the entire room is permeated, for instance, with microwave photons from the cosmic microwave background. We are only able to detect photons when they interact with the retina of our eye. Um, we're only able to detect the photons that are coming from specific sources. So um, I see the photons that are coming in through my window and have reflected off of the pavement, the house, the leaves, and everything else outside. Um, so, so we see things at the end path of their existence. Now the way that we're able to interact with the entirety of the universe is we look for those photon on, on object interactions. So we detect planets because of how photons reflect off of them or how more often the planet actually blocks photons from the star behind it. So 90% or more of the detections we make are based on being able to see photons being produced, photons being reflected, and photons being blocked. When it comes to dark matter, we only detect dark matter through a fourth method. And that fourth method is how photons are being bent. Now, as, as much as we might want it, we'd, we'd love it if photons were bouncing off of dark matter and illuminating it for us the same way gas and dust gets illuminated. Um, or we'd love it if the dark matter was blocking light the same way dust and, and, and molecules do. But Dark matter has what is, is almost a unique property. Neutrinos kind of do this too. 
of, of not wanting to interact in any way, shape, or form with the electromagnetic force. This, this means that photons and, and dark matter just don't interact with one another, and we don't, see the, we don't see the emitting, we don't see the blocking, we don't see the, the reflecting, except in the rare instance we think of very, very, very rare interactions that folks are trying to detect in all of these neutrino detectors that are being adapted to look for specific types of dark matter. Um, with dark energy, we, we don't know yet if it's, if it's a force or a stuff or a quality of the universe, so, so we're not even looking for a particle for dark energy right now. Um, so did anyone else have a question? Put your hand up. There we go. So Matthew, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I actually had a couple questions, if you don't mind answering them. One of them mostly related, one of them only tangentially related. Um, <laughs> the one that's mostly related is, um, and, and I asked this in the comments, but I don't know if you guys got around to it, which is, um, are metamaterials, is, is the basis for their negative refractive index because of the way that different materials cause light to refract at different angles? And the, the second question I had is, is for Fraser, which is, um, I saw you posted that Mass Effect 3 trailer. Will you do an astronomy cast episode for the science of Mass Effect? I think that could just be some That'd pretty be awesome. good fun. That'd be awesome. I think we'd need to have a guest. I actually know exactly who I'd want to ask, too. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't let myself install video games, except between my birthday on December 12th and Christmas on December 25th, because otherwise I will lose my life to them. I learned this in college, um, so I haven't played. I just um, cut my cable. That's all. So much TV. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has it, Mass Effect is, in my opinion, the greatest video game that's ever been made. Now, we don't need to have a fight about it, because I'm in control of this hangout. But, uh, <laughs> <coughs> um, but yeah, and Mass Effect 3 is coming out in just a couple of days, and I cannot wait. <laughs> so, but it is like it's just such a cool science fiction uh, world universe, one of the nicest universes. That's almost my favorite part of the game. So, so and and the the initial question you're act asking about, there are very strange materials out there that have uh, what are referred to as negative indexes of refraction, which um, these are materials that essentially allow pulses of light going through them to come out before they enter is, is the way it gets referred to. Um, but, but because of the way this works, no information is transmitted in the process. And the, the way this works is a pulse of light is actually made up of a whole lot of different wavelengths that combine in different ways. And so you'll have some of the wavelengths start going through while others are still going through, and it appears that the center of the pulse ends up in the front before it's actually entered the back. But this is just a side effect of how the, the waves are getting added up. Um, it's, it's all very confusing. And there's some really good videos of this, but the key is no information is transmitted faster than the speed of light. And these are just intr intrinsic properties of how the different wave packets are transmitted through the material. I just want to say for everybody, I think we all appreciate the fact that now that we can see you using all of your hand gestures, that is so cool. <laughs> Only, you know, before, only on Skype, I could see you drawing boxes and explaining <laughs> orbits and things like this, and now everyone gets to see it, which I think is so cool. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so does anybody else have a question for Pamela? And while you're thinking, Bridget Shiran, Shireen, I have no clue. I'm sorry, I'm just going to mispronounce everyone's name by policy. That way everyone yeah. feels equally mispronounced. Sounds good. Um, is asking, someone ask about redshift. Um, uh, does this cause photons to lose energy, and if so, where does it go? Yes, actually a redshifted photon has a lower energy, and the where does it go is it actually just got spread out. So as our universe expands, you can imagine that in a small universe, you have a wavelength of light that is spread out across this small universe, and it's a happy little blue photon. Now as the universe expands, well, that same amount of energy is now spread out over a much larger volume. It's now shifted into the red through the stretching process. So you're detecting a lower energy, but that entirety of the energy has been spread out over more of the universe. Uh, so Graham was, was the person who dropped in a couple of times uh, 
in the Hangout, and he's actually one of the administrators over at the forum that we run. Um, but to, but he, want, he, he mentioned something, and you know, I cannot believe we, we forgot this in the episode, which is, can we make a mention of how fiber optics work? Because they're a classic oh, example yeah. of, of refraction being used for... It's actually reflection with fiber optics. It's, it's complete internal reflection. So, so the way this works is, is um, you, you can see this underwater sometimes. If, if the sun is straight overhead or a pool light is, is straight uh, beneath the surface of the water, the, the light is going to go straight through the surface of the water. Now, if instead the, the light is over on the side of the pool, when it hits, a lot of that light is going to instead get, stay within the pool and get reflected downwards. Now, as you increase the angle to the surface, more and more of the light is going to get reflected and stay within the swimming pool until eventually all of the light is going to end up staying within the pool because you've hit a critical angle and it's called complete internal reflection. Well, fiber optics are designed such that if any of the light that's sent in through the, the back end of the fiber tries to escape out the side, it's always going to hit at the critical angle or a more shallow angle so that the light can never escape through the sides and all of the light is forced to make it all the way through the fiber optic. Now this is part of why you can't bend fiber optics. If you bend, well you can bend them a little bit, but if you bend fiber optics too much, first of all you're going to damage them and that's a bad thing. But second of all you're going to make it so that the material, uh, so that the light does hit the material at an angle that isn't a critical angle and so some of the light will escape because you've, you've over bent the suckers. If I may jump in on this, um, that's actually that principle is used um, in some instrumentation applications where the fiber optics will have diffraction gratings uh, etched into them so that as the bend of the fiber optic changes, uh, it actually will reflect the light at different frequencies and you can use that to measure the angle of bend in the fiber optic. That's cool. I didn't know that. So yeah, learn something new every day. That's kind of awesome. Um, yeah, so fiber optics are, are just designed so that, that the light doesn't pass through their sides. Now another time that they aim for complete internal reflection as much as possible is actually in how they carve gemstones. So when you have a, a diamond that is said to have a lot of, I don't know what Fraser's, do, oh Fraser has fiber optics. <laughs> Fraser's just full of toys today. Um, you, we can't hear you. Yeah, I've got a Oh, I'm sorry. I've got a fiber optic. I've got a fiber optic cable here that is a little light that my daughter has. She has a, like a light that goes on it, and then it it shows up, right? Uh -huh. So you underneath the the light glows, and then the light comes out, and you see the little little bits of light on on every little fiber optic cable, right? And so then I'm I'm bringing together lasers and fiber optics here at the same time here. Let's see if this works. So is that working? Yeah, it is working. Yeah. So you and can if I accidentally said light. total internal refraction, I didn't mean to. I meant to say total internal reflection. Yeah. So if you can see up close, you can see the laser. That is really cool. You can see the laser coming through the bent fiber optics, and it's being completely absorbed by the, uh, by the fiber optics. There you go. And that's why we do video. <laughs> um... Great. Okay. So, did anyone else have a question? I think we're getting sort of the end of this show now. Um, oh, one thing to let people know: last week's episode got corrupted in the recording. So, unfortunately, YouTube there, ate it. It just ate it, and so I went to try and gather and edit the video, and it just said, "Sorry, it's been destroyed." <laughs> so that's it. Um, so, unfortunately, we will never see what happened last uh, last episode. We're sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have uh, Fraser Valley Astronomers who doesn't have a name. Paul. Paul, you should use your name, Paul. We can't hear you. You're muted right now. No, I'll, I, like, I like spreading the word of our society, you see. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> suck so, it. So, but before you get into it, though, I just want to say, hey. you know, Paul, you've got the amazing Dark Sky Park just outside of Vancouver in a, in a small town called uh, Abbotsford. And it is one of the coolest places to go. If you're in the Lower Mainland and you want to uh, sort of see the, the night skies as you're supposed to see it, definitely check out their night sky park. They do observing. I've been out there a bunch of times. I love it out there. Yeah, and speaking of that, uh, uh, Abbotsford is growing. 
Chilliwack is growing. So the the section of the area that we can actually see the Milky Way from in that park is starting to, you know, diminish. Oh no! Well, probably over years, right? So just to let you know, I'm I'm working on another dark sky reserve up towards Merritt, uh, Merritt British Columbia, and oh, it should be about 17,000 square kilometers worth of area that would be underneath a dark sky umbrella. So uh, the only thing that would, uh, you know, uh, take precedence over that would be mining. But even then, you have a mining site that would have to use dark sky friendly lighting, which is safer anyway. Yeah. Put the light down on yeah. the ground so these guys can see what they're doing rather than getting run over by a tractor because the guy in the tractor is blinded by the light that's shining in his face. Anyway, that's another question. project. You had a question. My question. <laughs> uh, I've been te bu building telescopes for years and making the mirrors for yeah. these telescopes. And here lately there's been some talk about micro ripple in the surface of the glass. So uh -huh. um, I'm just, I just want to know if that is something that people should concern themselves with or not because they're, they're, these coatings that we're putting on the glass now is uh, hang on a second okay <laughs> all right he's finished <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that dog but I, you just anyway um, uh, the reflective coatings that we're using nowadays is you know anything from aluminum to like you said silver yeah. to titanium uh, to t titanium wow. mix with uh, with silvers and aluminums and that kind of thing. So micro ripple really it's, it's going to depend on the on on the size of the ripple. Um, so so what I, I'm looking at is that it's coming up with uh, these are usually one millimeter to two millimeter in some materials uh, fabrication errors. Now at that size you do need to start worrying about it in the surface. Um, oh yeah, but we're down to a billionth of an inch. Billionth. <laughs> okay, so that that's going to be sub angstrom at that point. No, at exactly. that point you don't so need to worry about it at all. It's just that I get these guys that are in our society and they get really going on this micro ripple thing, you know, and I'm sitting there looking at them like, have you got three heads or what, you know? Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, yeah. At that at that point, you don't need to worry about it. It's. Uh, yeah, it, seventh wave is is usually considered. Oh my God, we're not going to get anything better than that. And, yeah, and see, we've got mirrors that. that are at uh, one thirty second of a wave. Yeah. You know, so you know, when they start talking micro ripple, I'm, I'm looking at them and go, "What are you talking about? And yeah. why are you concerning yourself with it?" So I just yeah. thought I'd run that one by you and see what your thoughts were on it. Yeah, no, it's it's you strictly do a comparison between what wavelength do you care about, what wavelength is the ripple at, and your ripples are way smaller than your wavelength. Not a problem. And on that deep technical astronomy <laughs> talk, hey, we we totally geek out here. You you know people get used to it, especially on the uh, on the observing nights that we do, uh, where we're talking about the gear and the filters and the wavelengths and all that. That's and if you start asking me software questions, we're going to like dig into the bowels of Unix. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, good. Well, I think at this note, I think we should wrap this up. So thanks again to everybody who joined us here in the Hangout. Thanks to everybody who watched it. Thanks to everybody who's watching us on CosmoQuest.org. Uh, really appreciate all of your questions. That is super fun. And thanks, as always, to Pamela and her gigantic brain uh, answering all of our questions <laughs> about space and astronomy. The next, what's the next thing then that we're going to be doing? I guess Thursday so morning. We've something on Wednesday, right? Yeah, so Wednesday night, and let me pull up the the times so Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific, midnight London, 11 a.m. Sydney. We're going to do the weekly science hour. We're going to have Phil Plate and Alex Filipenko on to talk about the 25th anniversary of 1987A and on modern supernova astronomy. So come join us then. Awesome. All right. And then Thursday, we've got two events. We've got the weekly space hangout on Thursday morning and our observing night on Thursday night. And at some point, not advertised ahead of time, we're going to spring a surprise episode of Astronomy Cast on you uh, right. so that no we warning. can prepare because next week I will be traveling. Yeah, there you go. All right, so again, thanks everyone, and, uh, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.